Good evening, good afternoon, or whenever you happen to be listening to this. Welcome to the Film Realist Podcast, the film and TV podcast from a complete nobody. That's hopefully for somebody. I'm your host, Kyle Naranya, here for a jam-packed episode that likely won't be all the content announced, given how more and more has been added. So there's going to be some changes to the release schedule, at least for the next couple of weeks. So you'll be able to hear that at the end of the episode. This week's episode will be a initial reactions to the first five episodes of Warrior Season 3, which has returned to HBO Max and Crave, if you live in Canada, as I do, and a review of Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1, and ending the episode will be a reaction to the first two episodes of My Adventures with Superman. There was a request, Jermaine, I got you, I'm going to review those episodes. So let's get into Warrior Season 3. Now, if you are a first time listener of the podcast, you might know that I am a massive fan of Warrior. I'm wearing T-shirts. You'll probably see those, I guess, potentially in the social media clips for this episode. Warrior is a show that was originally conceived by Bruce Lee in the 70s when he was not cast in Kung Fu, which obviously, of course, went to David Carradine. And he created this show that was essentially a Chinese Kung Fu Western during the dawn of the Chinese Exclusion Act in California. And so the show was created eventually, or co-created, I guess, technically, by Jonathan Tropper, who made Banshee, and it had a two-season run on Cinemax before it was eventually absorbed into HBO Max, which is now Max. Season 3 has had five episodes, and I have thoroughly enjoyed them. If you are finally getting into this show after... The massive social media pushes seems to be some positive sometimes that these things happen. I think I I think I think season three is a phenomenal example of how to continue a show upping the stakes, continuing the character relationships, challenging each and every one of those characters while also preventing new challenges that these characters haven't had to face before. I should preface this that anytime I'm doing one of these television show recaps or initial reactions, even if the season isn't initially done, there are going to be spoilers just because it is easier to talk about. So if you have not watched the first five episodes of the show, I highly recommend you do. I'm going to be getting into a little bit of spoilers with this. The main noticeable thing that if you are not aware of the massive time gap between the actual filmings of the show is that clearly the characters have aged, but outside of that, Every character has developed in more interesting ways than the show had possible to do before. With the introduction of the printing press and using that to make counterfeit currency, I think that hurdle that is something we had not seen before is interesting. Typically, when you get to season three, it can become more of the same. I'm a fan of shows that have done that for quite a while. Supernatural is a good example. Suits is another one where... The challenge of the hurdle that the characters had to face was continuously the same. But the gang war between the Tongs or the Chinese gangs, as well as the impending Chinese Exclusion Act, has been something that has been prevalent throughout the entire show so far. But introducing that and bringing Lee into a different aspect of the law enforcement being related or working for the Secret Service is a really interesting challenge. And the way that his relationship developed specifically with Bill, Big Bill or Bill O'Leary is a relationship that has had a multitude of different interactions, given the fact that Lee was somebody who was on the right side and not again or was against any of the bribery or the backhand dealings that were going on in Chinatown and eventually resulted in him leaving the force because he was assaulted by one of the Chinese, by one of the Tongs because of Bill's actions and the fact that he's now working for the Secret Service and where we find Bill at the end of episode five, where he has actually left the service or the, the police because the new police chief brought in by the new wannabe mayor is something that I did not expect to see particularly in this season. Some of the elements of the cliffhanger of season two have not necessarily been addressed yet. I like Buckley's part of the Blake relationship. We haven't seen Penny at all or Penelope at all so far this season. I'm very curious if that's going to be a loose thread that hopefully gets addressed near the back half of the season. There have been a number of new characters also introduced this season, and I've enjoyed them so far. We have the daughter of the printing press company, or 
family run store that is printing and the relationship that she develops with Assam. I think that having Andrew Koji work on a bunch of different projects before coming into the season did him a lot of good. I wouldn't have criticized him as an actor before, but there is a depth to his performance as a Psalm this season that seems to be significantly improved over seasons one and two. I even have enjoyed the episodes where we got even more of a focus on young June. Joseph to- Jason Tobin is an actor I've quite enjoyed. He's very funny in his appearances in the Fast and Furious films. And Young June was a character that probably had the least development through the first two. But him being a leader now of the Hop Way and his relationship with Assam is very much tested so far, given how he now knows that Mai Ling is Assam's sister. How does that relationship move forward? And we get to see a lot more conflict between the two of them than we had in the first two seasons. I've really enjoyed where this is going. I'm very curious if this season is going to ultimately end with the Chinese Exclusion Act being put into place, how that's going to affect everybody. Episode 5 does really shake up the status quo like a mid-season finale. It doesn't have a cliffhanger like you would typically expect, but I think that Season 3 might be so far the best storytelling we've had from the first three seasons. I commend everybody involved coming back to a show almost... Three years after they after they would have fil- finished production on season two, it's something to be said for how good the show is back. The action is, of course, the best you're going to see on TV. The drama is good. If you are a fan of shows like Black Sails, Vikings, I highly recommend you check out Warrior season three. I can't wait for episodes six through ten, and I hope that we get a season four. That's all I have to say after the first four episodes. I'll probably do a season as a whole review when it finishes in the next, I guess, five weeks from now. So you can look forward to that. But let's jump into my initial reactions of my adventures with Superman. My adventures of with Superman of Superman. No, it's my adventures with Superman. There's only been so many different titles for his different comic books as well as just TV series. So my adventures with Superman coming to Adult Swim from, of course, Warner Brothers. Again, it's weird that this isn't on Max. I don't understand that, but that's okay. Starring Jake. John Jake, it's been a very long day. Can you tell? Jack Quaid, Alicia, Alice Lee, and Ishmael Saheed. As Clark Kent, Lois Lane, and Jimmy Olsen, there was a request for me to cover this. I'm sorry the episodes, I haven't covered the most recent episode, but there's been a lot of content to catch up on while I'm now back from my vacation, so let's cover it. This is probably a reaction that, if you're a long-time listener of this podcast or you're aware of the television and movies that I'm into, you might have a certain pre-assumed opinion of how I'm going to feel about this. And I have to say that I didn't have high hopes because there was, the trailer wasn't necessarily great. Animation-wise, there's been a consistent, or I should say lack of consistency with budgets for animated products. Streaming services, the model for those are significantly different than back in the toy selling days. Not that I saw any toys for this, so I'm not exactly sure. I do have young children, and I don't think I did see any toys for this. But... I think that my adventures with Superman is very charming. It's very entertaining. Do I think it's going to have the action that I have seen in other animated Superman properties, whether that's Young Justice, Superman the Animated Series, Justice League? It is. This show is as if Justice League action and Superman the Animated Series made a baby, a TV baby, where... The television show, I think, is much more family friendly than even the DC animated universe content was. This, while still not being condescending to children, if that makes any sense. I'm not a fan of a television series that is aimed at children, that's condescending, or talks down to children. The shows that seem to be the most popular are shows that treat children respectfully and show them Stories that may have mature content, but through the lens that a child can understand. Jake Wyatt, who developed this show, I believe, for Adult Swim, has worked on a bunch of different television series. There has been a 
complaint that this is the She-Ra of My Adventures with Superman. Quite frankly, I think She-Ra was a great show. Also, in terms of Masters of the Universe content, I loved Masters of the Universe Revelation, and I'm really looking forward to, I believe it's Revolution, is what the new series, Connect sequel series to that show on Netflix was and is going to be. These characters, specifically comic book characters that are now 80 plus years old, have to change. If you are telling the exact same story every single time, whether that's tone or how you handle these characters, they need to evolve. I'm not, I think the fact that all of these versions of the characters are similar, but yet unique in their own right is fun. I think it's very heartwarming to have somebody like Jack Quaid, who quite literally, physically at this exact moment, does not would not fill out the Superman suit, but the Clark Kent that he portrays is one of complete earnestness and feels like the farm boy who was raised in Kansas and not the showboat that... Not that Superman would be that, but the center of attention is certainly not something that Clark Kent is used to doing. And I like the spunkiness and independence of Alice Lee's Lois Lane. The fact that they've established the relationship between those two, that there is some potential love interest so early on, is an aspect that, off the top of my head, I can't remember in another Superman series where that happened very quickly. I know that super, or Lois's first introduction to Clark Kent in Smallville was him shirtless and memory, his memory had been or he had lost his memory. So it was like a physical, oh, you're really hot. But the fact that the, she is connected to Clark and likes Clark and not Superman first is a dynamic I hope to see them explore moving forward with the show. So if this is not your cup of tea, I completely can understand that. But I have enjoyed the variety of these characters that we have had. Whether that's Christopher Reeve, on to Brendan Routh, Henry Cavill's version of the character, we are going to be getting Superman Legacy in 2025 if things work out for the the people, the SAG and the WGA who are currently striking. They deserve livable wages. These facts that the bonuses that these executives are getting are subs- even higher than they were before during the last strikes is quite frankly ridiculous, and I side more so with the WGA, but of course, actors deserve to be paid fairly for the work that they're doing, and the fact that streaming models have prevented them from earning residuals, which used to be a substantial part of television pay, is something that I think certainly needs to be addressed. And obviously, there are the concerns over artificial intelligence and how that's going to affect the creative industry as a whole is something to be said. But Sorry, that was a tangent, just talking about the eventual release date of Superman Legacy. But I, Superman and Lois is another version that told a different story. This is not going to be for everybody, which I find disappointing. It did give me the storytelling potential of something like Voltron Legendary Defender. I know that may seem like a stretch, but after two episodes in, I enjoyed that this show clearly has a unique vision, and that is especially important when you are handling these fundamental comic book characters. So if that is the case moving forward, as it seems to be so far, I'm looking forward to following the show. I'm going to be watching the remainder of season one. Let me know if you didn't like... Actually, you know what? Scratch that. Let's just move on. This is what I thought about it. If you didn't like it, that's okay. You are entitled to that, but I did enjoy it. So... Let's move on to the feature film review of this, which is Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning, Part 1. Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning, Part 1 was directed and written again by Christopher McQuarrie. The seventh and potentially penultimate Mission Impossible film in the series. We know we're getting, of course, a Part 2, but where we are going after Part 2... That is yet to be determined. I'm a big fan of the Mission Impossible uh, films. I'm a fan of the films. Again, I apologize. It's I'm out of practice, but we will get through this together as you listen and as I speak. (laughs) Um, This film had high expectations, of course, as every Mission Impossible since probably four onward. They have drawn a lot on the stunt. And of course, visual medium being what it is. Tom Cruise wants to do the next big thing that is going to draw audiences to want to see these things, these films on the big screen. And of course, the motorcycle sequence leading to skydiving has been in every marketing 
or every marketing piece of marketing material that we had seen in every clip, trailer, photo leading forward to this press announcement of any kind. So the the expectations were high, specifically for me after Mission Impossible Fallout. I absolutely adored that film, and I thought it was the absolute best of the franchise. And the fact that these films have become more serialized is something I have enjoyed. Having the team around Ethan continuing to move forward with him has added more development, and those relationships are significantly more meaningful given the fact that we know they've experienced all these insane and impossible events with Ethan and that dynamic is better the longer the actors as well get to work with each other. So I was excited for this. This is going to be the non-spoiler section. I know I forgot to mention there is going to be two parts of this review. There's going to be the non-spoiler section I'm doing right now and there will be a warning for the spoiler section of the review prior to getting into it. So non-spoilers. I think this film is this film is very good. Does it reach the heights of Mission Impossible? That's my chair. <laughs> Fallout and even Rogue Nation? I would say no. What this film does successfully is essentially from the minute it starts, it puts you on the edge of your seat with almost a level of anxiety for what is going to happen next. Which is something that I commend Christopher McQuarrie and everybody involved for doing where that level of uneasiness that they are able to imbue onto the viewer is not always done successfully. And the fact that I would say it is, is something to be said. What I enjoyed most about the film is that while knowing it is part one of two, part one of a two part story, similar to Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, I think it manages to tell a complete story with a significant loose end moving forward that is going to be addressed in part two. Of course, I'll get into that in spoilers. All of the new additions to the cast, I think, are interesting. I don't think they're as good as some of the supporting characters we've had before. I really did like Palm Clementif's hench character, but ultimately there's, there's not a ton of development. I would make say that it's ironically akin to Guardians of the Galaxy co-star Dave Bautista's role as Mr. Fix in Spectre, where they had an interesting take on the visual for that character, but they're not. she's not given a lot to say. The action is stellar, as per usual, given the stunt coordination in the Mission Impossible films, especially late after that bathroom sequence that was so popular in Fallout, and there are some substantially interesting fight scenes in this film, but she's, I think it's a character that's uninteresting. Ultimately, he's not going to stand the test of time with these films. I do think that Haley Atwell is fantastic. I felt the same way about her character that I felt about Henry Cavill's character for different, re similar but different reasons in the, in Fallout, which is they are clearly such a talented and charisma imbued actor when they are on screen that while speaking. Henry Cavill was dealing with the maybe he's going to be Superman, maybe he's not era of his career. And he was so phenomenal in Fallout that Haley Atwell with Agent Carter has been kind of ping ponging around. And her character of Grace is a fantastic addition to the universe and where that character starts and where that character ends. I'm very curious to see what they do with her in part two. Outside of that, of course, we know that Kittrich is back. He's in all the marketing materials, as well as Isai Morales, who ironically was Slade Wilson in Titans. And that character, ironically, also deals with swords. So I would assume he's very well trained, given the fight sequence that we do know he has with Ilsa, Rebecca Ferguson's character. And the hand-to-hand -hand combat between the two of them is very captivating. This tells a very grand and big story. And it's very well done, but I think because the focus is very broad and the film is asking you a lot in terms of thinking about how each of the missions that we've seen prior, as well as what the MacGuffin and object goal is for the impossible mission force or and Ethan's crew in this, I think it becomes a little muddled given how there is a lot of handover and alliance switching back and forth the fact that the crew and the supporting characters has continually expanded is something i think is good when you are trying to potentially round out this series with an eight film story that realistically didn't start being serialized till four with um ghost oh my goodness 
Ghost Protocol. That's what that's what five was called. And so even the additions of Vanessa Kirby, who was Max's daughter in Fallout, those continuing continuing relationships are really interesting. And I think that there is a substantial amount they can do with part two. Obviously, it is it is not half of a story. It isn't the first act of a two part story, if that makes any sense. So there is a decent enough cliffhanger, but objectively enough of what the focus of this movie is ends with part one and i'm very curious to see what we do with part two the amount of characters that we know are going to be continuing into it are interesting and something i'm hoping for if this is rounding out this version of the mission impossible universe i hope to see more supporting characters from the other films specifically one through three and four i guess to some degree brought forward into it i did really enjoy the film but when the bar was set so high with fallout I think this is very good. I would say this is as good as Ghost Protocol and Rogue Nation, which are still phenomenally well-executed action-adventure films. Tom Cruise is, of course, the best on-camera runner we've ever had in the history of cinema. And I enjoyed this. I can't wait to watch it again. I may not see it again in theaters. If you want to see it on the biggest screen possible, I would recommend that. In IMAX, I've heard it's absolutely incredible. The score is also very well done. It was done by the same composer, Lorne. Balf, I believe is that how that's pronounced. If I mispronounce that, I am sorry. But I think the use of the score in this is very well executed. The cinematography of just using real world action, real world elements in this film is something that I think can go really underestimated. It's ironic because this film has some action set pieces that take place in the same locations as Fast X. But the fact that the action is handled more practically makes it significantly more captivating and thus more entertaining as a viewer. So without getting into any spoilers for that, I really did enjoy Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. I would recommend you go and see it. I would like to talk even more about it and I'm going to do that as I jump into spoilers for Dead Reckoning Part 1. All right, so as with every other Mission Impossible we've ever had before, there is a MacGuffin. What is the MacGuffin? Well, interestingly enough in this, the MacGuffin is a double-sided key that you see elements of in the trailer while not knowing necessarily what that key has access to. And what it does have access to, which is there is an AI that was actually developed by... Now, I don't actually know if we know who developed it. I'm assuming it's NATO. Let's just say it's NATO. And that this AI has con- has broken out of its coding and has become independent. And the object is every nation wants access to both of these keys so that way they can control the entity, which is what it's called. It's as vague as humanly possible. And of course, it's going to be as vague as humanly possible because you don't want to upset any particular nation. One of the elements that I enjoyed most about this film is how it brings in elements from all the other films while not being a cardboard cop copy or cutout of those things, that metaphor fall, fell apart as I was trying to do it. But having Max involved in this is significantly more relatable if you are a fan of all of the films. The relationship that Vanessa Kirby's character has, Alana, I had to look that up really quickly, with specifically Kittredge and how she is playing all the sides of the scenario because we know Isai Morales' character, who is Gabriel, somebody from Ethan's past. And that is one of the elements I really did appreciate about this film is how it is trying to tie every single film. Well, maybe not two. Maybe, maybe do Gray Scott's in, in Dead Reckoning Part 2. That'd be incredible. But the fact that it Gabriel has a relationship with Ethan prior to him being enlisted into the IMF which explains to some degree why Kittredge is back working with the CIA. Now, we don't know if he actually ever left, but clearly he's at some significant ad- level that we may or may not have seen. I ha- should have looked up exactly what level of the CIA he was before. Maybe he's the director, but with the passing of Alec Baldwin's character, things are kind of in flux in terms of who is in charge of IMF, who is in charge of the CIA. But we know that Kittredge has a significant amount of power. And... Getting to have a character who knew Ethan prior to his IMF days is especially interesting. This is somebody who does not have to learn about what Ethan is capable of. He is aware of what Ethan is capable of. And his antagonistic relationship with Ethan is especially interesting because he is working for the entity. 
he can learn from the entity how to react to any possible scenario, even if multiple human beings are trying to outsmart him. So you have that element of trying to outsmart a computer. Kind of the inverse, I guess, technically, of the Turing test, which was to prove you weren't a computer, you had to outthink it. It's ironic because this does have to deal, of course, with all of the nuclear powers trying to m gain access to this entity. I discussed before in the non-spoiler section of the episode how I really did appreciate the developing relationships in this story and how they've continually evolved. There does seem to be restraint in terms of the may will they, won't they with Rebecca Ferguson's character, Ilsa, and Tom Cruise's character. And something I did not expect, well, typically with a penultimate film, you know you're t likely going to lose a character. And the fact that it wound up being Ilsa, who has, as I mentioned in the non-spoiler section of the Rue, a phenomenal fight sequence with Gabriel ultimately is killed. There was a fake out in the very beginning and I was half assuming we might get another fake out with that character's death in the film, but that being the motivation for Ethan and that character who establishes throughout the entire franchise, but especially says that in this film that he is willing to lose his life for those he wants to protect, specifically the people in this room, the team that he is working with. And the fact that the antagonist of this film takes somebody he deeply cares for really does test him at the climax of the film. And the strength of Ethan's character ultimately leads to him being successful while not achieving the ultimate goal, which the goal in this film is to get both half of the keys and also find out exactly where the source code that is would be the only way to destroy or control the entity would be. So that's the plot of this film where Obviously, finding the entity source code will be in the second film. And I mentioned Haley Atwell's character of Grace, who is somebody for Ethan to protect. She is a thief who gets wrapped up in this. She, it, we learn that she was hired by Alana, Vanessa Kirby's Max daughter, daughter, to get the key. And the way that she learns to trust Ethan and that he is there for the greater good. It has nothing to do with na which nation they serve. And the relationship that they develop seems to be similar to Ethan's relationship with Carrie Russell in Mission Impossible 3, a student of his. Obviously, there's a significant age gap between Haley Atwell and Tom Cruise, and I'm hoping that does not lead to some form of romantic relationship because it would be a disservice, I think, to Ilsa's character to be killed off in this film. And for that to be the case, also Ethan's real or Ethan's wife that they had to pretend die in Ghost Protocol, we know is still alive, and we've seen her in Ghost Protocol and Fallout, and we there's obviously some for, sort of connection between those two characters, so I'm hoping that's not the case. I mentioned the stunts. The stunts are going to be the stunts, and they're captivating and incredible to watch, and the fact that Tom Cruise actually did drive a motorcycle off of a cliff and parachuted is absolutely insane, and the cinematography for that sequence is incredible and it's real and I think I felt similar dissimilar but somehow similar to when I watched Avatar the Way of Water where this that's not real but it it looks completely real and this is so hyper real we know that Tom did do this it it's mind-blowing and there's no other way to describe the set piece of that but I mentioned in the non-spoiler section we do get a car chase through Rome and Continually, they find new and interesting ways to have car chases, motorcycle chases, and the fact that this franchise has been able to evolve the way that it has to be being probably the most consistent action franchise that we do have is something to be said. And I'm very much looking forward to Dead Reckoning Part 2 when that hopefully comes out soon. Obviously, with all these strikes happening, that's going to affect everything's release date. But this is a thoroughly entertaining popcorn film that I would say, not that you should see it in theaters, you need to see it in theaters. I All of my criticisms, I don't really think there's anything to say specifically. I know I just completely cut myself off, but in terms of specific plot details, but everyone's relationship evolving and potentially not, uh, the alliance is changing all the time. It's just not as neat as Fallout, and with Fallout having the twist as to who the John Locke character was, something that propelled that film, where this film, you know where everybody 
sits for the most part, except for a couple of the newer characters. So that just, it lacks that difference. Again, this is a very good movie and you should, you need to, I cut myself off and I'm cutting myself back to my sentence, which is you need to see this in theaters. Highly recommend. It is a film that deserves the big screen experience and you should see it on the biggest screen possible. That will do it for my non-spoiler review of Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning. All right, I don't like to go super long with these episodes, so I'm going to end this one here. Next week's release schedule is going to be very different. Of course, this is coming out on a Friday. I'm typically on Monday, but Mission Impossible, if you're listening to this day of review, technically came out today, even though you could have seen it earlier. So next week's going to be very weird. There may or may not be an episode on Monday reacting to news and trailers. If that's not the case, if you are subscribed on whatever your podcast platform is, you will see that that does not happen. What will happen to get back to regular release schedule is this. And I'm going to leave it slightly as a surprise. I will be releasing an episode that is either Barbie or Oppenheimer on Friday next week. If you're listening this to after the whatever the release date is. For Barbie, things will obviously change if that is the case. But the 21st, one week from day of recording and episode launch, will be of Oppenheimer or Barbie. On the Monday of that week, so the 24th, there will be an episode reviewing the other film. So if it's Oppenheimer Friday, it might be Barbie on Monday or vice versa. So there will be two episodes to get back to the regular release schedule. And then moving forward, we will review whatever we will review. I know I didn't get into Secret Invasion this week. I'm going to I'm behind on that show, which is why that was not the case. But I hope you enjoyed this episode of the podcast. Please review it on your podcast platform. Share it with a friend. The theme song for the podcast, of course, was composed by the band You vs. Me. You can find their music on Apple Music and Spotify. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I'm really glad to be back. I hope to see you on the next one for either Barbie or Oppenheimer. You'll have to listen to find out. <laughs>